A teratoma is a type of tumor. Tumors as they are get a bad rap, as many times they are the sign of cancer or other more life-threatening illnesses. The idea of a tumor alone inspires fear. Teratomas are most often harmless, certainly benign. Though once you get inside them, they become terrifying. They are often filled with hair, teeth, organs, functioning organs. Some believe that teratomas are the result of twins in utero when one is absorbed by the dominant embryo. That part of it lives on, semblance of a sibling, snuffed, absorbed, trapped. The most famous of these would be the story of Edward Mordrake, a young man in the 19th century, heir to a prosperous English family, born with a face, a woman's face, on the back of his head. This face was said to frown whenever he was merry, and when Edward was sad, it would smile and laugh. This was enough that Edward traveled across Europe, seeking every doctor of renown, begging him, pleading with him to excise this demon from his skull, for it whispered to him in his sleep of things that only the devil should know. It was because of this that young Edward Mordrake took his own life at the age of 23. Now, whether or not you believe that did these things, the presence of it was enough to unhinge the mind of Edward Mordrake, lead him to suicide. And if that's not enough for you, you might consider the story of Edmund Carnick, who awoke one night, 2 a.m., in Las Vegas, walked across state lines barefoot and killed 13 people along the way, mindlessly slaughtering without pause, till he was struck down in a hail of gunfire by police officers. His last words, as they loaded him into the ambulance, were, Oh my God, what's happening? Please, Somebody call my mother. When they performed his posthumous examination, at the base of his skull, they found a teratoma containing teeth, an unblinking eye, and a functioning brain. That's not to say that this was the reason these events happened to him, but if you were absorbed robbed of a potential life, trapped within a dark, wet space, knowing someone was out there enjoying the life you would never have. Would seventeen years be enough to lead you to violent revenge? Who can say? These are dark times, and these stories come from very dark places. <laughs> Good evening, listeners. This is Professor Jonas Armitage, and you're listening to Stories from Dark Places. On tonight's show, we'll be listening to a story from Ray Bradbury, a brilliant sci-fi author who could spin amazing stories of times to come, some of which were uplifting, positive, and gave you a sense of hope, and others could paralyze you with a sense of dread, a sense of loneliness. Ennui. We'll also be featuring music from a young up-and-coming musical artist who has requested, through a connection to the show, that we feature one of his songs on our broadcast, which we're very happy to do. We will be back with our story momentarily, but first, a message from our sponsors. Hi, this is Danielle from WZHP. When I'm looking for a comfortable place to take the whole family to eat dinner, but I don't want to break the bank, I go to Abby's. Serving the downtown Smith area since 1957, Abby's is a rustic diner that specializes in American comfort food. Whether it's those deep fried peanut butter and pickle sandwiches you saw in that diner food show, or niche northern cuisine like Alaskan skinkheads, or even if you just want a hot slice of stargazy pie, Abby's has it all. 
Abby's on the corner of Martins Avenue and 12th Street West. Show your membership to Marsh Hall and get a slice of stargazy pie a la mode on the house. In the living room, the voice clock sang, Tick tock, tick tock, seven o'clock. Time to get up, time to get up, seven o'clock. As if it were afraid that nobody would. The morning house lay empty. The clock ticked on, repeating and repeating its sounds into the emptiness. Seven nine, breakfast time. Seven nine. In the kitchen, the breakfast stove gave a hissing sigh and ejected from its warm interior eight pieces of perfectly brown toast, eight eggs sunny side up, sixteen slices of bacon, two coffees, and two cool glasses of milk. Today is August 4th, 2026, said a second voice from the kitchen ceiling, in the city of Allendale, California. It repeated the date three times for memory's sake. Today is Mr. Featherstone's birthday. Today is the anniversary of Tilita's marriage. Insurance is payable, as are the water, gas, and light bills. Somewhere in the walls, relays clicked. Memory tapes glided under electric eyes. Eight one, tick tock. Eight one o'clock. Off to school, off to work. Run, run. Eight one. But no door slammed. No carpets took the soft tread of rubber heels. It was raining outside. The weather box in the front door sang quietly. Rain, rain, go away. Umbrellas, raincoats for today. And the rain tapped on the empty house, echoing. Outside, the garage chimed and lifted its door to reveal the waiting car. After a long wait, the door swung down again. At 8.30, the eggs were shriveled, and the toast was like stone. An aluminum wedge scraped them into the sink, where hot water whirled them down a metal throat, which digested and flushed them away to the distant sea. The dirty dishes were dropped into a hot washer, and emerged twinkling dry. 9.15, sang the clock. Time to clean! Out of warrens in the wall, tiny robot mice darted. The rooms were a crawl with the small cleaning animals, all rubber and metal. They thudded against chairs, whirling their mustached runners, kneading the rug nap, sucking gently at hidden dust. Then, like mysterious invaders, they popped into their burrows. Their pink electric eyes faded. The house was clean. Ten o'clock, the sun came out from behind the rain. The house stood alone in a city of rubble and ashes. This was the one house left standing. At night, the ruined city gave off a radioactive glow, which could be seen for miles. 10.15. The garden sprinklers whirled up in golden founts, filling the soft morning air with scatterings of brightness. The water pelted window panes, running down the charred west side where the house had been burned, evenly free of its white paint. The entire west face of the house was black, save for five places. Here the silhouettes in paint of a man mowing a lawn. Here, as in a photograph, a woman bent to pick flowers. Still further on, their images burned on wood in one titanic instant. A small boy, hands flung into the air. Higher up, the image of a thrown ball. And opposite him, a girl. Hands raised to catch a ball, which never came down. Five spots of paint. The man, the woman, the children, the Paul. Remained. The rest was a thin charcoal layer. The gentle sprinkler rain filled the garden with falling light. Until this day, how well the house had kept its peace. How carefully it had inquired, Who goes there? What's the password? And getting no answer from lonely foxes and whining cats, it had shut up its windows and drawn shades in an old maidenly preoccupation with self-protection, which bordered on the mechanical paranoia. It quivered at each sound, the house did. If a sparrow brushed a window, the shade snapped up. The bird, startled, flew off. No, not even a bird much touched the house. Twelve noon. A dog whined, shivering, on the front porch. 
The front door recognized the dog voice and opened. The dog, once huge and fleshy, but now gone to bone and covered with sores, moved in and through the house, tracking mud. Behind it whirred angry mice, angry at having to pick up mud, angry at inconvenience. For not a leaf fragment blew under the door, but what the wall panels flipped open, and the copper scrap rats flashed swiftly out. The offending dust, hair, or paper, seized in miniature steel jaws, was raced back to the burrows. There, down tubes which fed into the cellar, it was dropped into the sighing vent of an incinerator, which sat like evil Baal in a dark corner. The dog ran upstairs, hysterically yelping to each door, at last realizing, as the house realized, that only silence was there. It sniffed the air and scratched the kitchen door. Behind the door, the stove was making pancakes, which filled the house with a rich, baked odor and the scent of maple syrup. The dog frothed at the mouth, lying at the door, sniffing. Its eyes turned to fire. It ran wildly in circles, biting at its tail, spun in a frenzy, and died. It lay in the parlor for an hour. Two o'clock, sang a voice. Delicately sensing decay at last, the regiments of mice hummed out as softly as blown gray leaves in an electric wind. Two fifteen. The dog was gone. In the cellar, the incinerator glowed suddenly, and a whirl of sparks leapt up the chimney. Two thirty-five. Bridge tables sprouted from patio walls. Playing cards fluttered into pads in a shower of pips. Martinis manifested on an oaken bench with egg salad sandwiches. Music played, but the tables were silent and the cards untouched. At four o'clock, the tables folded like great butterflies back through the paneled walls. 4.30, the nursery walls glowed. Animals took shape, yellow giraffes, Blue lions, pink antelopes, lilac panthers cavorting in crystal substance. The walls were glass. They looked out upon the color and fantasy. Hidden films clocked through well-oiled sprockets, and the walls lived. The nursery floor was woven to resemble a crisp cereal meadow. Over this ran aluminum roaches and iron crickets, and in the hot still air butterflies of delicate red tissue wavered among the sharp aroma of animal spores. There was a sound like a great matted yellow hive of bees within a dark bellows, the lazy bumble of a purring lion. And there was the patter of okapi feet and the murmur of a fresh jungle rain, like other hoofs, falling upon the summer starched grass. Now the walls dissolved into distances of parched grass, mile on mile, and warm, endless sky. The animals drew away into thorn breaks and water holes. It was the children's hour. Five o'clock, the bath filled with clear hot water. Six, seven, eight o'clock. The dinner dishes manipulated like magic tricks, and in the study a click. In the metal stand opposite the hearth where a fire now blazed up warmly, a cigar popped out. Half an inch of soft gray ash on it, smoking. Waiting. Nine o'clock, the beds warmed their hidden circuits, for nights were cool here. Nine-five, a voice spoke from the study ceiling. Mrs. Mrs. McClellan, which, which poem would, would you like this evening? evening? The house was silent. The voice said at last, Since, Since you, you express no preference, preference I, I shall select, select a poem at random. random. Quiet music rose to back the voice. Sarah Teasdale, as I recall, your favorite. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pools singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire, and not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly, and Spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that they were gone. The 
fire burned on the stone hearth and the cigar fell away to a mound of quiet ash on its tray. The empty chairs faced each other between the silent walls and the music played. At ten o'clock, the house began to die. The wind blew. A falling tree bow crashed through the kitchen window. Cleaning solvent, bottle, shattered over the stove. The room was ablaze in an instant. Fire! Fire! screamed a voice. The house lights flashed. Water pumps shot water from the ceilings. But the solvent spread on the linoleum, licking, eating under the kitchen door, while the voices took it up in chorus. Fire! 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 fire. fire. The house tried to save itself. Doors sprang tightly shut, but the windows were broken by the heat and the wind blew and sucked upon the fire. The house gave ground as the fire and ten billion angry sparks moved with flaming ease from room to room and then up the stairs. While scurrying water rats squeaked from the walls, pistoled their water and ran for more, and the walls spray let down showers of mechanical rain, but too late. Somewhere, Sighing, a pump shrugged to a stop. The quenching rain ceased. The reserve water supply, which had filled baths and washed dishes for many quiet days, was gone. The fire crackled upon the stairs. It fed upon Picassos and Matisses in the upper halls like delicacies, baking off the oily flesh, tenderly crisping the canvases into black shavings. Now the fire lay in beds, stood in windows, changed the color of drapes. And then reinforcements. From attic trap doors, blind robot faces peered down with faucet mouths gushing green chemical. The fire backed off, as even an elephant must at the sight of a dead snake. Now there were twenty snakes whipping over the floor, killing the fire with a clear cold venom of green froth. But the fire was clever. It had sent flame outside the house, up through the attic to the pumps there, an explosion. The attic brain which directed the pumps was shattered into bronze shrapnel in the beams. The fire rushed back into every closet and felt of the clothes hung there. The house shuddered, oak bone on bone, its bared skeleton cringing from the heat, its wire, its nerves revealed as if a surgeon had torn the skin off to let the red veins and capillaries quiver in the scalded air. Help! Help! Fire! Run! Run! Heat snapped mirrors like the first brittle winter ice, and the voice wailed, Fire! Fire! Run! Run! Like a tragic nursery rhyme. A dozen voices, high, low, like children dying in a forest alone. Alone. And the voices faded as the wires popped their sheathings like hot chestnuts. One, two, three, four. Five voices died. In the nursery... The jungle burned. Blue lions roared. Purple giraffes bounded off. The panthers ran in circles, changing colors, and ten million animals running before the fire vanished off toward a distant streaming river. Ten more voices died. In the last instant, under the fire avalanche, other choruses, oblivious, could be heard announcing the time cutting the lawn by remote control mower or setting an umbrella frantically out and in, the slamming and opening front door, a thousand things happening like a clock shop when each clock strikes the hour insanely before or after the other, a scene of manic confusion, yet unity, singing, screaming, a few last cleaning mice darting bravely out to carry the horrid ashes away, and one voice with sublime disregard for the situation read poetry aloud in the fiery study, until all the film spools burned, until all the wires withered and the circuits cracked. The fire burst the house and let it slam flat down, puffing out skirts of spark and smoke. In the kitchen, an instant before the rain of fire and timber, the stove could be seen making breakfasts at a psychopathic rate. Ten dozen eggs, six loaves of toast, twenty dozen bacon strips, which, eaten by fire, started the stove working again, hysterically hissing. The crash, the attic smashing into kitchen and parlor, the parlor into cellar, cellar into sub-cellar, deep freeze, armchairs, film tapes, circuits, beds, and all the skeletons thrown in a cluttered mound deep under. 
smoke and silence. A great quantity of smoke. Dawn showed faintly in the east. Among the ruins, one wall stood alone. Within the wall, the last voice said over and over, again and again, even as the sun rose to shine upon the heaped rubble and steam. Today is August 5th, 2026. 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 There will come soft rains. It is a powerful story, one that spins a tale that fills you with a sense of isolation. And while I cannot speak for everyone, it does in fact give me some level of unease. The threat of nuclear war, the end of everything, it seems to be something that creeps upon us a little bit closer every day. I do appreciate that it's not here yet, and I do my best to keep positive, but, well, the power of these decisions lies not in the hands of men, but in the hands of those with power and wealth who think themselves gods. Moving on from that, next we'll be featuring a song from a young artist named Foxgloves. He is apparently the cousin of Kai the Intern, who is putting together to release an EP and has requested that we play one of his songs on the air. Something, as I said, we're very happy to do. We at WZHP Radio Innsmouth firmly believe in the support of artists and performers, those who seek to entertain and to share their gifts and inspiration. If you have a song or a story or something you would like to feature on our broadcast, please let us know. Reach out to us at storiesfromdarkplaces at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at storiesfromdar1. Now, without further ado, I present Foxgloves and his song, Silver Moon. To the beat of the moonlight's heat Right through the cracks of the forest streets Sticks and stones underneath your feet Right beneath the light of the stars so sweet Do the math, it's not concrete Run in the light of the silver moon No, the silver moon Chase the shadows of the silver moon No, the silver moon Silver moon Beneath the shining sky The shadows of the trees so sly As the wind sways them to the shining side As they hide their roots for what you might find And the orchestra of frogs they sing The serenity that they will bring As we talk to the millions of stars As they keep our secrets away so far We don't deserve we see Run in the light of the silver moon No, the silver moon Chase the shadows of the silver moon No, the silver moon Silver moon
Well done. An excellent song. Not my usual genre of music for the most part, but the talent and potential is undeniable. I imagine we'll be hearing big things from him in the future, and I look forward to seeing his success. If you would like to find more about him, more of his music, or just to learn about the artist, you can find him on Twitter at FoxGLUVS. I imagine he'll be keeping you up to date on the impending release of his music, as well as other things about him. It's always good to learn the people who provide you with the things that move you. Anyway, that's all the time we have tonight. Join us next week as we provide you another chilling tale to entertain. Until then, good night, listeners. And please remember, when you tuck yourself in at night, you hear the soft whispers of things in the shadows. Remember this. There's nothing to be afraid of. After all, some of the best things only happen in the dark. Stories from Dark Places was recorded before an imaginary studio audience. All stories performed on this podcast have express written consent from the original author. Jonas Armitage, his studio manager, and the entire staff of the WZHP Radio Innsmouth are fictitious characters, and it's probably for the best that you continue to believe that. Are you itching for a good story, laughter among friends, maybe a mystery? Fire Breathing Kittens is a standalone Dungeons & Dragons podcast. Each episode is a separate three-hour-long story, like a movie for your ears. You can listen to these adventures in any order. Join us on a real-play Dungeons & Dragons quest as we solve mysteries, attempt comedic banter, and enjoy friendship. Fire Breathing Kittens podcast. Fantasy, action, mystery, and friendship. Oh, yeah,